Advent series called uh, Emmanuel Foretold. Have it on the screen behind us and also up here. That's why the stage is decorated. And in this series, uh, we're going to be looking at a few of the many Old Testament prophecies that the birth of Jesus fulfilled. So instead of just looking at the Christmas story, I, and, and really, you, know, you would think Christmas would be really easy, but as a pastor, you don't want to keep doing the same thing over again, and you're trying to squeeze everything out of, out of a single story that you can get out of it without boring people um, that have heard it countless times. So instead of looking just at the Christmas story, I felt the Spirit leading us to take a look at how the Christmas story actually fulfilled many prophetic statements made by hundreds, made over hundreds and thousands of years before Jesus first came. So before we start, I would like to just make a few statements, comments you would say, might say. First, I know that as history has progressed from the original Christmas story, Christmas has become a lot less about Christ and worshiping him and a whole lot more about consuming things for our own benefit. It almost feels like Christmas has become like Valentine's Day and it's being controlled and influenced by Hallmark or the card companies or corporations trying to get us to be distracted and spend all our money on presents and decorations. Just walk into Walmart. You'll, you, you'll know what I'm talking about. I feel like Christmas has become uh, just another one of the many holidays that we do lots of stuff and, and make ourselves so stressed out and overwhelmed that we forget to worship God for the gift that he sent us. It's more about buying things and doing things and just getting through the season than it is about worshiping the reason for the season. Never once in the Bible does God give any sort of commandment for us to buy presents and celebrate what he did by buying presents. That is not in the Bible. Not once. So why are we doing it? Why, have you ever thought about it? Why you spend hundreds, some of you hundreds of dollars and uh, even maybe even more than that? Why do we even do it? The practice of exchanging presents started almost a half a century after Jesus was born. Jesus already come, half a century he's been, had been gone. And it was a practice that was started in the early church to mimic what the Magi did of bringing the gold, frankincense, and myrrh to Jesus to celebrate him. The giving, though, was supposed to be an offering to the Lord. So just as the Magi were offering gifts to Jesus, the exchanging of gifts and stuff was supposed to be, a, was supposed to be a, an offering to the Lord. I'm doing it as an offering to the Lord. And I would ask this question as kind of a self-evaluation for yourself in your life. Do you feel that your Christmas morning practices and traditions are an offering to the Lord? Was what you do on Christmas morning an offering to the Lord? When your family meets together to celebrate Christmas, does God take a whiff of offering? Because picture, if you remember in the Old Testament, we've done a couple of Old Testament studies since when they would do an offering and they would burn the sacrifices, it was the, the aroma would go up. All the smoke and everything of the burnt sacrifice would go up and God would say, that is a pleasing aroma to me. It's a pleasing aroma, your sacrifice. So your Christmas morning, as you guys are ripping and tearing presents open and trying to keep the kids from fighting with all that kind of stuff, is God saying, oh, oh yeah, that's a pleasing aroma. And if your house is anything like mine, our exchanging of presents at Christmas can become borderline sinful. I'm making, I'm going to make this next comment, not because I'm a cheapskate, which I am, but because I truly have this conviction in my heart. I'm not even sure the practice of gift giving to my kids in particular is even a good thing for them. I, I'm coming to that realization. I think it, it's causing more harm to them than it is helping them in their life. 
I have a feeling a lot of kids and teenagers that are here, Meadow's giving me daggers right now, but I have a feeling that a lot of the kids that are here are not going to like Pastor Zach after this message. But I am serious. And it's my responsibility to push all of us to be better followers of Jesus and to be better parents leading our kids or our grandkids. If our kids have this expectation that Christmas is where they get what they ask for, what they want, if they're good, doesn't that help create selfish and self-entitled children? Does it not? Dad, I'm good, so why didn't you get me this? I, I don't understand it. Does it also not teach them the opposite truth uh, about God? Okay, and their relationship with God. God does not, and I think we all know this, hopefully. God does not give us whatever we ask for. Whenever we ask him, he doesn't always give it to us. No matter how good or obedient we are. No matter how many times you read your Bible, it's not like if I'm really good and I really follow God with all my heart and follow all of his, all of his commandments, it's not like God then like says, okay, green light, whatever you ask for, that's my favorite kid. You're getting anything. Absolutely not. He only gives us what he, he knows we need. And so the, what I don't understand is we do this for our kids. So we're teaching the opposite of what God really does in their life. He, God gives just what we need, which as parents, we do year-round, right? We give our kids just what they need, all right? And so, in my opinion, I, I think, uh, but just at, the God, uh, just at the perfect right time, if, if we're going back in history, talking about Christmas, at just the perfect right time, God gave humanity the greatest gift that we can never provide for ourselves. Salvation through Jesus. So a better demonstration as parents or grandparents would be giving each one of our children one amazing gift that the kid didn't even know that they needed, but they greatly benefited from. So if you want to literally be biblically accurate and wanted to follow the example of God, as you give your kids these presents, you should give them one present that is amazing, one, one amazing gift that your kid didn't even know that they wanted. They didn't ask for it. And that, I'm not talking about an ugly sweater or socks because they have holes in them, okay, or whatever. But one present they didn't even know, and, and, and as they get it, they never knew they even needed this. But it was the greatest gift. Now, I know I'm probably stepping on a lot of toes with these comments, but I don't care. Okay, because I feel like it's important as I look at what is happening to Christmas that's been happening for years, I feel like it's important that we talk about this, that we have conversation, that you actually think about it. Because I feel like a lot of times we get in these ruts and we continue to do the same things and we call them tradition. And sometimes traditions end up being sinful. If we don't keep control. And I feel like I, I feel like some of you right now, if you're thinking in your head right now, man, I man, I, I don't know if I could ever not give my kids presents. I mean, what would that be like? Well, how bad of a parent would I be? Or, or, or you're thinking all these things. I understand I'm stepping on some toes this morning. I guess my hope in this series as we work up to Christmas is that maybe for the first time we evaluate. What we are doing at Christmas as families. For your family, is Christ at the center of Christmas? That's a pretty bold statement here, and it's a, it's a good question to ask. Is Christ at the center of your Christmas? Or has consumerism and traditions taken the front seat of importance? Are decorations... Our parties and presents and activities and shopping and food, what is most important to you and your family at Christmas? And you might be saying, oh, no, no, it's just stuff we do. Okay, well, what do you spend the most time doing? Worshiping Jesus or doing those things? Are there changes that need to happen in your family's traditions 
so that you can get back to the only thing that is important, your family worshiping Jesus altogether. Here's a good barometer for your family. If you didn't set up any decorations this year, and I know many of you have already done that, but let's just say you didn't, inside your house or outside your house, and on Christmas morning you just crashed and read the story of Jesus' birth, and then just stopped and worshipped and praised God in your living room. Would your family revolt in your home? Would your children have a revolt? Would your wife or your husband have a revolt? Or, or whatever, would there be a massive revolt in your home? If your family would be happy with that time spent together, you're doing a great job of raising a Joshua 24, 15 home. And again, if you're not reminded, that was our theme from our last Family Matters verse, which again... That last, last, last part of that verse, but as for me and my family, we will serve the Lord. So if you're able to do that, just crack open the Bible, have a worship service, and that's all you do. You can have pancakes if you want that morning. I don't, I don't care. Okay, but if that's the main focus of the morning and not, when we open presents, when we open presents, and that's the thing, and your family would, would find joy in that, you're doing a great job. Now, I can't find very many families that would do that, would have that. I'm not even there yet. Megan, and I does, Megan doesn't even know about this sermon yet. I just surprised her. So this is going to be interesting after we go home. <laughs> but as for me and my family, we will serve the Lord. That's the Brahma. So, But if your family is probably like mine, if your home would be in utter chaos from that experience, and tears streaming down faces, and even anger coming out of people then maybe this Christmas we right the ship and put Christ back at the center of our homes and our families. I mean, we just finished a 12-week series on Family Matters. And if you are just joining us, I encourage you, you can go on our Facebook page or um, YouTube and you can watch every single one of those messages, which are I, I felt were very in, spirit-led and impactful for our families. But if, if we're going to be a family that follows Jesus and, and leads leads our family to know Christ and to walk with Christ, then shouldn't, be this something that we, shouldn't this be something we're teaching our children, the real meaning of Christmas, and fixing errors that may have been occurring within our family and how we worship God during Christmas. So to put Christ back in Christmas, let's go beyond the Christmas nativity story that we have behind us and, and, and behind my back. Because the actual Christmas story, I want to go beyond the Christmas story again, because the Christmas story began long before the story we read, we read in the Gospels of Matthew and Luke. The birth of Jesus was foretold many years before they actually happened. The Bible is full of prophecies that are about the Messiah, and Jesus fulfilled them all with his life. They don't say his name specifically. But after you know the life and the mission of Jesus, after you read the Gospels and the encounters of Jesus, you know that when you go back and read the prophecies, you know they're about Jesus because of how he lived his life and how he fulfilled all of those. That it was, they were all about Jesus of Nazareth. The prophecies fit what we know about Jesus. Because we know the life of Jesus and we know who he is, we can read the prophecies like Isaiah 53 and know who it's referring to. This is a little lengthy, but I want to read this as a kind of an illustration to my point. Isaiah 53. should be behind me. It says this. My servant grew up in the Lord's presence like a tender green shoot, like a root in dry ground. There was nothing beautiful or majestic about his appearance, nothing to attract us to him. He was despised and rejected, a man of sorrows, acquainted with the deepest grief. We turned our backs on him and looked the other way. He was despised and we did not care. Yet it was our weakness he carried. Weaknesses he carried. It was our sorrows that weighed him down. And we thought this troubles were punishment from God. A punishment for his own sins. But he was pierced for our rebellion. Crushed for our sins. He was beaten so we could be whole. He was whipped so we could be healed. All of us like sheep were straight away. We have left God's path to follow our, sor our own. Yet the Lord laid on him the sins of us all. He was oppressed and treated harshly, yet he never said a word. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter. And as, sheep, and as a sheep is silent before the shears, he did not open his mouth. Unjustly condemned, he was led away. No one cared that he died without descendants. 
that his life was cut short in the midstream, but he was struck down for our rebellion of my people. He had done no wrong and had never deceived anyone, but he was buried like a criminal. He was put in a rich man's grave, but it was the Lord's good plan to crush him and cause him grief. Yet when his life is made an, op- his life is made an offering for sin, he will have many descendants. He will enjoy a long life, and the Lord's good plan will prosper in his hands. When he sees all that is accomplished by his anguish, he will be satisfied because of his experience. My righteous servant will make it possible for many to be counted righteous, for he will bear all their sins. Okay, so this was 700 years before Jesus even set foot on earth. Okay, this was, I mean, this was the detail of this prophecy. And you read that, and if you know the Gospels, if you know the accounts of Jesus' death, there's no way you can read that passage and not see Jesus in every ounce of it. There's no way you can't, even though it doesn't say his name, you can't read that and not know that that is Jesus, that they are talking about, the life the, the, exactly what happened to him to the, to the point that he was put in a rich man's grave and that he would live again, as it says. Through the life that we read about in the Gospels, God used Jesus to fulfill 350 prophecies foretold about the Messiah. Jesus fulfilled around eight prophecies in just one day, the day that he was born. The prospect that anyone would satisfy those eight prophecies in one day in a lifetime has a probability of 1 in 10 to the 17th power. Again, if you're not a math math person, that's 17 zeros. That's a bigger number than any of us know how to say. I I don't even know what it is. I don't don't know, not billion, quadrillion, gazillion, I don't don't know what it is. Okay, but 17 zeros. And that's just him fulfilling eight prophecies. Okay, again, Isaiah's prophecy, this prophecy that was made just in in, in 53, Isaiah 53, was 700 years. Let me just give you an idea of what that is, okay? 700 years. You take the age of the United States, 1776, we became a country, 1776. Take that, double it. So the the length that we've been a country, okay, double that, and you still have 100 more years to catch 700. Okay, so that's how long before Jesus came that he made this prophecy that Jesus fulfilled. There's a visualization, I've done this before, uh, and, and I think I wanted to do it again. Um, it would be like covering the state of Texas. Okay, there's state. I mean, Texas is the second largest state in the United States as far as land, ma- land area. Ar- or, uh, not Arkansas. Uh, Alaska is number one. Okay, Texas is number two as far as land area, okay? If you cover the entire state of Texas in silver dollars, two feet high, two feet high, okay, up to on your legs, it would be like one man marking a silver dollar, dropping it, and somehow mixing it all together, mixing the entire state of Texas together, and then you blindfold a man and send him out there, and he happens to pick the correct silver dollar. On the first try. That is the probability of one in the tenth power, one in one in ten to the seventeenth power of Jesus fulfilling eight prophecies that the prophets were able to correctly prophesy that Jesus would fulfill eight prophecies. That's how that's the probability of that happening. And Jesus not only fulfilled eight, he fulfilled three hundred and fifty that number of 17 would increase exponentially. If I, it's impossible. I don't think it's possible to calculate that probability of him being able to fulfill 350 prophecies. So let's focus on one of the birth of Christ. Let's just, just one as we prepare for Christmas. Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14. I'm sure this is very familiar with a lot of you. It says, all right then, the Lord himself will give you the sign. Look, the virgin will conceive a child. She will give birth to a son and will call him Emmanuel, which means God is with us. This was, again, 700 years before Jesus was 
was born prophesied that he would be born of a virgin and that he would be called Emmanuel, which means God with us. And this isn't a guess or a shot in the dark prophecy. Okay, like I, 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 there are some people that say they're prophets and they'll just say pretty broad statements a, a, as a guess. It'd be like me saying, okay, I think it's going to be, uh, this, this person's going to be important. He's going to be the firstborn and son. He's going to have brown hair and he's going to have a freckle on his right cheek. And he's going to like to fish, he's going to like to hunt, and he's going to like games. Be on the lookout, he's important. That's pretty much a, a pretty broad guess, because there's probably been a billion people since Isaiah made this prophecy that fit that description. Brown hair, has a freckle on a cheek, and likes to hunt fish and play games as a boy. I mean, you're, you're pretty much, that, that's pretty easy. But that's not the prophecy we get here of 700 years ago, okay, before Jesus. It says, someone born from a virgin birth, now that's unique. That's something that doesn't happen all that often. Matter of fact, it's never happened. Okay, and so that's something that's going to be easy to flag down, okay, to say, okay, well, okay, now that's something that, that's something that's quite unique. Or, or, or that, um, oh, he also is, he is God. God with us. When he becomes, when he comes, then it's God is with us. So he is God. Okay, so you got two very unique, unique prophecies uh, here. Uh, uh, details. Not brown hair, not the way he looks, not the stuff that he likes, but that he'd be born of a virgin and that he is actually God as well. Just as foretold, the virgin Mary indeed did conceive and bore a son who is called Emmanuel. This amazing event demonstrates God's infinite knowledge and power He's capable of foretelling the future with perfect precision. And he has the power to bring his prophecies to pass. If, if he gives someone the words to say, like Isaiah, 700 years, he's going to have the power to bring it into the present. Even if that meant allowing a virgin to conceive and bear a son. We read about this fulfillment in Luke chapter 1, verse 30 through 35. So let's read the fulfillment. It says, don't be afraid, Mary, the angel told her, for you have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you will name, and you will name him Jesus. He will be very great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his ancestors, David. And he will reign over Israel forever. His kingdom will never end. Mary asked the angel, but how can this happen? I'm a virgin. The angel replied, the Holy Spirit will come upon you. And the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the baby to be born will be holy. And he will be called the Son of God. Then Matthew kind of gives a different angle of it. In Matthew chapter 1, verse 20 and 23, he says, an angel of the Lord. This is actually the angel talking to uh, Joseph now. Uh, appeared to Joseph in a dream. Joseph, son of David, the angel said, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for the child within her was conceived by the Holy Spirit, and she will have a son, and you are to name him Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. All of this occurred to fulfill the Lord's message to the prophet, look, the virgin will conceive a child, she will give birth to a son, and, they will be called, and he will be called Emmanuel, which means God with us. So Matthew even goes as far as to link Isaiah to the angel's description to Joseph. While well, thinking about the circumstances surrounding Christ's birth, Christians can rejoice that the Messiah has come to be with us. And in that being with us, that we just celebrate in communion, he dealt with our sins because he came to be with us. We can praise God for fulfilling his promises, but just for a moment, for the rest of this message... I just want us to take a moment to celebrate what it means that God is with us. From the moment Jesus was born, he was offering himself to anyone that would choose to accept him, himself, choose life, to experience life in him and to know him, to know God. God chose to live this life, the life that you live. God chose to live this life just as we are doing right now, except when God did it through Jesus, he was perfect. And through the life that he lived, Jesus was able to become our salvation. He not only came to save us, but he lived 
this life so that we can come to him and under that uh, come to him understanding that he knows exactly how we feel. Do you understand that? The idea that God is with us that means that when he came to live, he came and he knows exactly every single thing, detail of emotion, all the things that you experience in your life. He knows what it is and can relate to it because he became flesh. So when you're broken hearted, Jesus knows what it's like to be broken hearted because he was broken hearted. He experienced the death of his stepfather, Joseph. He experienced people mocking him and ridiculing. He knows what it's like to be brokenhearted. He understands our experiences. When you're lonely, he gets it. He had a brother, multiple brothers, that didn't even believe he was the Messiah. That told him he was crazy. He was left alone countless times where he couldn't relate to people. His desire, instead of to go play games and hunt and fish, his desire to be with the Father, he understood what it was like to be lonely. He understands what it felt like to be rejected. The disciples he spent three years with pouring his life into all rejected him in the very end. He understands what it's like to get stabbed in the back and be rejected by the people that you're closest to. To be hurt by the people that you're closest to. We can have complete confidence that Jesus will always be with us because he is true to his promises. But also because he is our great rescuer and he understands what we're feeling and wants to help us through every circumstance that we have. Every hurt and pain in your life, he wants to help you through that because he's experienced what it's like to go through those things. The name Emmanuel literally means the strong God with us. Because of what Jesus accomplished, God can literally be with us through his spirit inside of us. When you accept Jesus in your heart, what happens is the spirit of God, the spirit of the living God comes and dwells inside of us. I know we often make a prayer, we often say a prayer in church tradition is that you say a prayer and then Jesus comes and dwells in your heart. Well, Jesus is a person. Okay, he can't dwell in your heart, but his spirit, the spirit of God is a spirit and come can come and live inside of us. And that's what happens. The spirit comes and dwells inside of us. And so that same spirit lives inside of us. The strong God with us. Emmanuel with us. Is with us forever when we accept Jesus in our heart. Dwelling and living inside of us. This is his temple. Ephesians uh, chapter 1 verse 19 through 20. It says. I also pray that you will understand the incredible greatness of God's power for us. Who believe in him. This is the same mighty power that raised Christ from the dead and seated him in the place of honor at God's right hand in the heavenly realms. Do you understand that spirit that God with us is, has the same power and authority and might that raised Jesus from the dead. A dead man raised a dead man from the grave still that lives inside of you. Do you get that? Do you understand the power that is dwelling inside of your body? Inside of your life? And this isn't, a, this isn't like a one-time rental. Or that spirit, you can only tap into it one time and then it's gone. No, this is, a, this is a constant thing. And it's not anything that you even have to earn. Like you can't, it's not like you have to do a bunch of good things and then God, again, flips a switch and says, okay, now you can access the spirit's power because you've earned it in your life. No, once you accept Jesus in your life, the spirit comes and you can access its power. Even if you're still flawed, even if still you're making mistakes, even if you're still struggling with different things, you access the spirit, it's right there for you. To help you overcome whatever you're going through in life. Matthew chapter 28, verse 20 affirms that to us. It says, teach these new disciples to obey all the commands I've given you. And be sure of this, I am with you always, even to the end of the ages. What an amazing promise that is. That that spirit inside of us, the God with us, is going to be with us all the way to the very end of the age. Forever. God with us, Emmanuel, is, a really, is really good news for us. Especially in our lives of trouble, disappointments, loneliness, sickness, and in death. How impactful is it knowing God is with us when we read scriptures like Psalm 23, verse 4, when it says, Even when I walk through the darkest valleys, I will not be afraid, for you are close beside me. When we go through the darkest moments of our life, the hardest moments, it's okay. Because 
we have the ability that he's, God is always with us. He is with us, and we can choose to find rest and comfort in his arms, even as we walk through the valley of the shadow of death. He will never leave us to face life's challenges alone on our own strength. He's always there. The Advent reading that we did earlier was all about hope in Christmas. I can't think of any better reason to have hope in our lives than knowing that God is always there with us as I walk in this life. What a blessed reason to celebrate every day, but especially at Christmas time. When Jesus came for the first time to choose to be with us, what a blessing that is and a reason to celebrate. Praising God for the moment he put on flesh and became one with us. Christmas should be the most glorious time of praising God. The problem is we often make all the things in our life about ourselves. Life becomes about what we enjoy instead of giving God what he enjoys, which is all of us. That's what he enjoys the most. All of us. That sacrifice of our lives to him in worship and in service and in just being there with him in a relationship. Even though God is with us as believers, we allow the flesh to take control of our lives. We do it often. We start choosing our own selfish desires that gratify ourselves versus pleasing God. We frequently choose ourselves in our day-to-day -day life. Sometimes I don't think we even realize it. We, we, our, our schedules and our priorities, you can see if, you just, if we all would just list out all of our schedules and our priorities, you would see how the flesh controls our lives much more than the spirit controls our lives. And I'm not saying that to, as guilt for anyone, because I'm, I'm saying that as guilt of my own life. How much the flesh, are in our decisions to uh, abide in the flesh, so much more supersedes our desire to fulfill God's desires in our life. God often gets squeezed out of our lives and our focus. He's just kind of, he's there, he's at the center, we accept him and he's there, and then he just kind of, becomes squeezed out and, and not as important anymore. Cindy, do we have that picture? Is that good? This is a, uh, it might be sideways. Yeah, you got to turn your head sideways. This is an old family picture that's at my grandma's house. I don't know if you can tell, but look at the, you, can you see the little guy in the middle that's squeezed, squeezed out? That's, that's me. And I've always been fond of this picture, and um, it has the grandkids that were there at that point, uh, that were born at that point. But I always looked at it and wondered, wondered, why in the world did grandma and grandpa squeeze out their favorite grandkid like that? <laughs> but um, I look at that, and, and uh I look, I know that's not their intention, so as I got older and stuff, I always thought, see, I told you, no one loves me. No, I'm not loved. It's always, look, uh, Luke's right there, and Mary's right there, and Megan, and Grandpa should have his hand around me, you know. But I look at that picture, I look at that picture, and as I got older, I realized that had Grandpa, knowing who he is and his character, known that I was being squeezed out like that, I know he would have responded, and he would have told me to sit up so they could see me and, and, and not be like that. But that's, that's what happens. You can take it off. That's a sap, sappy picture. Yeah. But that's what happens in our lives. A lot of times for Christians, I don't think it's intentional, and I don't even think we're aware of it, but we allow God to be squeezed out. God who's in the center of the picture of our life, who should be at the center of the picture of life, like I'm in the center of that picture, we allow him to be squeezed and crushed and become just a little hidden figure within our lives. And we don't see and guard ourselves and see the sanctity of who God is in our life and, and, and guard it so that doesn't happen in our life. Since God is with us, we can't allow him to be squeezed out of our life. Even when we read the Bible, sometimes we're guilty of squeezing God out of his own word. We try to, 
we read scriptures and try to make it about us. We take David and take the story of David and Goliath. We we all make ourselves David as we read that story. We all make ourselves David and we we look at all of our problems that are in front of us and we say, well, that's my Goliath I need to conquer. And I'm not saying that there isn't some truth in that message, but that's not the primary truth of that story. You are not David and David and the Goliath story. Do you know what David, when you read that story of David and Goliath, who David should point you towards? Who it should remind you of? The blessed son of God who comes from the lineage of David, Jesus. Do you know who you are in the story of David and Goliath? You're one of the scared Israelites who's scared to death and unable to do anything to save themselves and are just a background character in the story. Until in that story, if you remember, until in that story, an unlikely shepherd comes and does for them what they couldn't do for themselves, just as an unlikely shepherd came to earth at Christmas time and did for us what we couldn't do for ourselves. That's the true story of David and Goliath. It's about the blessed hope that came down, took down sin, took down hell, and the grave. But for us, it's hard to follow Jesus when we don't allow him to be the main character of our lives and we squeeze him out. Jesus is the hero of the world, period. Exclamation point. He is God with us. Question is, will you let God have all of you? Or are you going to allow him to be squeezed out of your life and out of Christmas? I am going to close here. Ben, go ahead and make your way forward. There's this, there's this story. Um, I, I read this article, or not an article. I saw this video of a pastor talking about him spent in China. And I want to end with this story. As he goes to China, he has this encounter. And, and he gets this opportunity to uh, minister to this Chinese church leaders for three days. And whenever they're leading these, these churches... Uh, these, these Chinese leaders, again, let me just, in case you don't know this, the, China is one of the most uh, difficult places uh, to be a Christian. It's one of the most persecuted places for Christians in the entire world. One of many places. And while he's teaching these uh, Chinese leaders, there's 22 of them, and he's having this conversation with them, and he says, what will happen if we get caught? And the guy goes, the, the church people go, well, we'll have to, you'll be deported from China, and we'll spend three years in prison. And he asked these church leaders, says, how many of you have been to prison already? And 18 of them raised their hands. And then he asked them, well, how many, how many Christians do you oversee? And they did some math. And they came up with those 22 people oversaw about 20 million people. Underground churches, 20 million people. And he had 15 Bibles as he was teaching. He had 15 Bibles and he said... Um, I'm sorry, I don't have enough. And the church people, the, the Chinese Christians were like, it's okay, don't worry about it, we got this. And he goes, how are they going to be okay with that without turning to the Bible or, or no screens or whatever? And he goes, and he realizes, because they said, he said, turn to a certain passage. And as he turned to a certain passage, what happened was they started saying it out loud because they had it memorized. And then he asked them, how do you have that, how do you have a whole book of the Bible memorized or, or half of the entire New Testament memorized? And they said, well, we memorized it while we were in prison. And he goes, how did you memorize in prison? They, they threw you in jail for being a Christian, so how did you have a Bible? He says, oh, no, no, we slip in the Bible in paper. People write scriptures on paper and we memorize it. And so, and he says, what happens if they confiscate? He go, and they go, that's why we have to memorize it really fast. And so, and guess what? When we memorize it, uh, we, when they take the paper, it's okay if they take the paper because they can't take the word that's hidden on our hearts. And he asked them, he says, okay, you guys are just blowing me away. These three days have been unbelievable. And he goes, how can I pray for you? And they said, these Chinese Christians said, that would you please pray that we would become just like you all in America to gather all together like you are able to do. And the man, the pastor who's there teaching says, I cannot do that. And I will not do that. See, you all rode, all these Chinese uh, 22 leaders, they rode 13 hours to get to this meeting and they spent hours there and they sat on a hard wooden floor and did all this for hours upon hours upon hours to be in God's presence and to learn about God. And he said, you guys rode 13 hours on a train and we can't get people to drive one mile to our churches. They sat on a hard wooden floor for three days and in America, if a service is longer than an hour, people complain and grumble. In America, we have an average of two Bibles per family, and in many homes, people in the family don't even know 
where to find psalms. Or even where the Bible is located at in their house. Where these people, these Chinese Christians that are being persecuted, memorize scraps, pieces of paper, memorize scripture on scrap pieces of paper, and sew it into their heart so they'll never lose it and never forget it. So this pastor leaves this church and he says, I will not pray that you become like us, but that we in America will become like you. Do you know the difference between the persecuted church across the world and an American church? As they're coming in, I want you to hear this. Here's the difference. They are not squeezing out God from their lives. That's the difference between us and them. The persecuted church is not squeezing God out of their lives. God is with them. And they are never going to replace him with the world. There is nothing this world is going to offer them that, will, that they will bargain and trade Jesus for. God with them, they'll never trade him for anything else this world has to offer. Nothing. They receive Jesus. They receive Jesus. And the only way, the only way you're going to stop them from having Jesus is by killing them. They see Jesus for who he is, the greatest gift ever given, where many of us find it hard to even keep Christ at the center of our Christmas. So my question for all of us as I close here, do you need a reset in your family picture? Do you need a reset in your family do we need to put God back at the center of your family and put him right in the forefront and not letting him get squeezed out by the things of this world and put him right in the center? Can we push everything out of our lives that does not belong, push it out so that God is at the center of the picture? Can we push everything out of Christmas that is not Christ's worship? Can we get rid of all the stuff that is garbage from this world so that we can worship God with us? Is that possible this Christmas? Can we set a new tone for our families? Can we get rid of the consumerism and all of the devil's traps and snares that he's put in there so that we can teach our kids and ourselves that God with us is the greatest gift, better than any gift we could ever give or buying gifts or presents for our kids or anything like that? Can we do that? Is that possible? Can we change things up this Christmas for the sake of our own lives and the sake for our kids? I'm going to end with this scripture, Matthew 16, 26. For what does it benefit to gain the whole world but lose your own soul? Is anything worth more than your soul? So for your kids' sake, I think maybe a refresher of Christmas, a recentering of Christmas might be the best thing for our lives. Will you please stand?